Hello everyone, in today's video we're going to be taking a look at the map slash scenario editor in command modern operations. So the scenario editor is extremely, extremely powerful as far as what you can do with it. And because of all the new additions in command modern operations over command modern air naval operations, um, we have a couple new toys to play with and we'll take a look at those today. So anyway, at the main menu you're going to start by clicking create new scenario. And that's going to bring you to this nice little uh, world model here. You've got all the different countries all listed out. And again, you can use your right mouse and drag in order to kind of zip around. You can go ahead and use your mouse wheel to zoom in and out as well. Now, one of the big things that I like to do when I first start a mission is before I even open up command, is I'll actually have my idea all worked out. I'll have worked out what part of the world it takes place. And sometimes when I do missions, I'll actually go over to Google Earth or I'll use a flight simulator to try to get an idea of where these things are actually taking place. But um, you can do that in your own way. Everybody has their own kind of inspiration, and we're just kind of, kind of, just go with it. So let's see what might be fun here today. Let's do something in, well, let's do Ecuador. Why not? We'll do Colombia and Ecuador. Make things interesting. Go ahead and zoom in here, make sure it's all set. So when you're building a map, the first thing you want to do is you want to go up to where it says Editor, and you want to click on Database. This is really, 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 really important. Set the database to the database you intend to be using for this particular operation. Notice the current database here is actually built for 72. Notice the newest database is actually database 480. It's probably going to be different at the time of this video that when you watch it. Keep in mind, if you're doing something in the Cold War, we want to set something to back then as well. So make sure you pick the database file before you do anything. This is critical. So I'm going to go ahead and do a modern scenario. I'm going to go ahead and now set up my sides. So I'm going to click on the Add button. Type in the name of my side. So we said Ecuador. And um, let's see here. Who should be our offenders here today? Um, Ecuador. Let's see here. Um, could do Peru. We could do Colombia. We'll do Colombia. Go ahead and click Add Sides. Go ahead and add the other side. Now, when you're adding sides, the name of the side does not matter. You can actually change the name later on. But what does matter is all these cool little buttons over here on the right. The first one we can take a look at. We can add or remove a side. We can rename a side. We can set up the side briefing. So for example, I can click on here and say something really funny like, get revenge for the loss at the football game. Keep in mind, you can copy paste, you can put all sorts of really, really good effects, you can put images, you can go nuts with a side briefing. You can even edit it as HTML if you really want to get sophisticated. I'm not going to go into that now, but feel free to explore it on your own. The other option, of course, we have is postures. Postures is very important. When I click this, it gives you the ability to click on another side and set the how you feel. Neutral is eh. Friendly is going to share intelligence information. Unfriendly is not going to necessarily fire, but they're certainly going to follow you around and look really, really mean at you. And obviously, hostile will fire on will. So go ahead and click set to, to hostile. Keep in mind, if you set one side's posture to hostile, you haven't done that for the other side. So if I click on Ecuador here and I click over here, I can set them to unfriendly, for example, in which case when Colombia attacks Ecuador, it will automatically change that. So just kind of keep that in mind when you set that up. Other options we have here is so we have the Doctrine and Rules of Engagement. This is important in scenario design because of this little button right here. This button allows you to turn on whether or not a player can edit a particular uh, rules of engagement. So for example, if I don't want the player to be changing that they're using nuclear weapons, I want to make sure that checkbox is off after setting this the way I want it to. Now there's a couple on here that we can get into and go into great detail, but there's basically a few that I want to point out. First one's going to be the ignore plotted course when attacking. If you're setting up an AI, chances are you're going to flick this to yes. It just simplifies things. If you want a very, very aggressive AI, you can set this. And of course, you have the should I fire at everybody? Should I fire at nobody? Keep in mind, if you lock the AI's ability to engage, it will fire in self-defense, but it'll never attack. So you can have some fun with those settings. Coming down here, you have stuff for your tankers. You have an important setting right here. This is um, how quickly you can basically get airplanes in the air and uh, maintain them. If it's set to surge, it's going to be pretty quick. Sustain is going to be a little bit longer. Keep in mind, in the real world, surge is only used for very short periods of time. So remember that when you're designing your scenarios. And again, we can turn this on or off. It doesn't really make sense to give the user control over this, but again, have fun. We have control over quick turnaround. Again, we can select this checkbox if we want them to be able to edit it. There's really no reason to give them 
reason to edit it. So keep that in mind. Fuel state, we have air to ground strafing, we have jettisoning and ordinance, everything is in here. And again, if we said by doctrine it's okay to do this, we can turn this on and click this little switch to now make it so the player cannot edit this later on. Keep in mind in scenario edit mode, you can go nuts with all this stuff. Uh, we have BVR engagement logic, and again, you can have a lot of fun with this kind of stuff, but don't go too crazy. Changing this, by the way, isn't going to really do much because the player can adjust it, and you can't really lock any of these, so kind of keep that in mind. The key element on the screen, though, is just remember, if this checkbox is activated, the player can edit it later. So if you have, uh, for example, an American carrier battle group and it has nuclear weapons on board, if you didn't tell them not to use it, don't be surprised that the player is going to use them because they're pretty powerful. All right, go ahead and close that. Next thing we know is we have these three options down here. These are very important. This one basically says that when the player um, signs into your scenario for the first time, they don't get an option of selecting that side. So this is sort of like if you want to make it like an AI or neutral or something. Collective, this is kind of neat. So let's say Colombia is neutral to Ecuador. But what happens is Colombia accidentally blows up one of Ecuador's ships. As a result, if you have the collective slicked on, that's going to make it so that Ecuador now declares war on everything Colombia. If this is off, Ecuador declares war on that single unit that attacked them. So it's you got to watch out for this feature. Auto track is cool. You're actually missing the other piece here. It says auto track civilians. So this particular option enables you to basically automatically track anything that has commercial in it, which is really, really nice if you're trying not to blow up friendly ships. Down here is an awareness. This is a tricky one. You have blind, which I highly recommend you use this setting for any civilian shipping whatsoever. It eliminates the calculations. You have normal, which is pretty standard. If I spot somebody, he's unknown until I can identify him. Auto side ID. This is kind of cool. You can simulate IFF with this. Basically, what this would say is if I pick up any contact on the map, I instantly know whose team it's on. This is the same thing, except I can also identify what unit it is. And of course, there's Omniscient, which is basically God mode. I can see everything at any time. I'm going to leave that at normal. Then last but not least, we have the proficiency slider. Now, the proficiency slider is cool because this sets the entire side's proficiency. If I crank this all the way up to maximum and start placing units, all these units are now aces. If I crank it all the way to novice, any units I place now are novices. Keep in mind, I can crank this to ace, place a bunch of guys, crank this back down to novice and place a bunch of guys, and now basically I've got two different proficiencies. I'm not going to get too crazy into what the proficiencies actually are. Basically, this is what you got to know. Regular means, I know what I'm doing with my weapon systems. I'm pretty well trained. I might have a little bit of experience. Anything on this end usually means I've got no experience. And obviously, novices, I, which one fires again? Flipping over on this side, you have veteran, which basically says, I'm a regular, except I've got a little bit more practice than the regulars. And obviously you have ace, which is yeah, pretty good. It's tough to shoot down an ace, as you know. But keep in mind, they're still destroyable with red weapons. So I'm going to leave this at regular. I'm going to set Ecuador also to regular. I'm going to leave all that other stuff alone. Now, here's a cool trick. If I double-click on somebody, it automatically selects that side. If I want to change that side later on, I can go up to switch to, and then I can just select the one that I want to do. Okay, so we're in pretty good shape so far. We're not quite ready to start plopping units down yet. So the next thing you want to do is you want to go up to Editor, and you want to go to Scenario Times and Duration. Now this is a little tricky, and depending on what your localization settings are, this might look different. Scenario Time is not the same thing as Scenario Start Time. Keep that in mind. So for example, if I set this to, let's say, 1985, we'll do, uh, let's see here, we'll set this to January, we'll set this to January 1st, we'll set it to pretty early in the morning. And now I press OK, we're going to have a problem. Because that means my current scenario time is 1985. However, if you remember, the scenario starts, actually it looks like it automatically copied it. That worked really, really well. That got lucky. It didn't used to do that in command. But anyway, you need to make sure your scenario start time is similar to your current time. Um, going down here this page, you can set a daylight savings if you need to. You can also come down here and set how long you want your scenario to go for. So one day is pretty standard. If you're only doing a single mission, you're probably going to have something that looks a little bit like this. If you're doing something that's extremely short, um, you do something along those lines. But again, it all depends on your particular scenario. Just make sure that this is a positive number, number one, and make sure, number two, that the current time does not see this time plus this time. Otherwise, your scenario is going to instantly end. These two settings, complexity and difficulty, are your decisions. You can make a scenario very complicated. You can make it very, very difficult. And of course, you get this neat little place here where you can go ahead and say where this particular situation takes place. Go ahead and press OK. OK, we're almost there, I promise. 
Next, what I like to do is I like to go up here. I like to swing on down to the weather feature. Now, the weather, unfortunately, is a little static. You can use Lua, which I'm not going to get into today, to adjust this significantly if you want. You can even have it change over time, which is really, really cool. The key element on the weather page is going to be your average temperature, your rainfall rate, your sky, and your sea state. If I hold my mouse just like this, you can see I've got a clear sky, no rain, 15, and wind C. Now what I like to do is actually look up the local weather of a specific area before just diving into it. If you actually look at our digital map, you can see there's significant cloud cover. Now average temperature is easy. This is going to be the average temperature. This is modified by altitude, by the way. So if I hold my mouse over something right here, you'll notice my average temperature is actually lower than if I hold my mouse down here. So again, this is average sea level temperature. Obviously, if we increase this, we make um, heat-seeking weapons not as effective. If we decrease this, we're going to make them more effective, and so on and so forth. So, for example, oh, this is the winter. Actually, no, this would be towards the beginning of the summer, because remember, we're in the southern hemisphere. So I'm just going to go ahead and crank that up to 20 Celsius. Rainfall rate, I'm not going to touch today. Sky. Now, this is tricky. There's really three groups of settings inside of this setting. If I just click it one notch, let me go ahead and close the screen, you can see that we have some low clouds that are between five and 7,000 feet. That's little tiny puffy things that you could probably expect to see pretty much on any day. There's no clouds above that. So now if I go up to weather again, watch what happens if I crank it a single click. Notice those low clouds have just floated up to 10,000 to 16,000 feet. So then if I do that one more time, you can expect to see high clouds, which if you take a look, we have light high clouds between 20 and 23,000 feet, which is what we expect. Now here's where it gets tricky. If I click this one notch over, watch what happens. My clouds shoot back down to the deck between two and 7,000 feet. However, they've gotten thicker. So keep that in mind when you're planning operations. So for example, let me click this two more notches. I expect to see some high clouds, which I do. Moderate high clouds between 25 and 28,000 feet. That's pretty significant, but it's, you know, imagine 50% clouds. Obviously, if I crank it all the way here, watch what happens. Now you have thick fog between zero and 2,000 feet, solid cloud cover between seven and 36,000 feet. So basically, there's a wall of cloud going straight up. Thick fog's visibility is like measured in a couple feet, a couple yards. So kind of keep that in mind when you're setting up a scenario. A lot of aircraft are affected by bad weather. So I'm going to go ahead and drop this. Um, let's do this. That looks pretty good. Last but not least, we have wind and sea state. If you set this to zero, this is basically no wind, which personally, I, I fly a lot. I don't remember seeing a day where there's no wind, except maybe at night. So anyway, clicking this up one notch. Whoa, hurricane. If I hold my mouse now, you'll see that our wind strength is now set to wind slash C1. So I'm not going to go look up the Beaufort scale real quickly, but that's that's not very much wind. Generally, when you're dealing with the ocean, you're going to be talking C state 3 and C state 4, which if I cranked it up a little bit, you can see now I'm at wind C3. Ships are affected by the wind state. So if I crank this up, for example, all the way up to C state 6, let's go ahead and get us uh, something kind of small. Let's go to ship, let's go ahead and get a PC, something teeny tiny. There we go, we'll get a cyclone. Notice his max C state is five. So at C state six, you've effectively crippled that ship. Obviously you don't want to be driving around C state six anyway, it's kind of messy. So anyway, keep that in mind when you're working with the weather. I personally usually leave it around three. This will affect accuracy of weapons. If you crank this all the way to hurricane, you're gonna have a really tough time hitting with anything. So kind of keep that in mind. It's fun to do, but like, I don't know what you need that for usually. So let's see what they got. C state three, I like that, okay. Now the last thing we're gonna do on this page without getting too fancy, and that's the scenario features and settings. Click this and you can set the realism settings. Keep in mind, once you set these, these are set. Detail via control basically tells a particular platform that says I have to actually be able to see the target and lock onto the target to hit it, as opposed to I can just woohoo, fire. You can set unlimited ammunition at AVAL and air bases. This, for users, can be a bad thing. Because again, users who will load up on JDAMs and things like that when you really wanted them to use Mark 82s. So keep that in the back of your head. Realistic submarine communications, this is a new one. Basically, it means you have to be at shallow-ish depth in order to communicate with the submarine. If you turn this on, it, it's going to get tricky. And then, of course, you have effects of terrain type, which just means if we're in the mountains and the trees, it's going to make it difficult to hit targets. And then we have communication disruption, which basically means if I blow my radio up, I can't talk to everybody, which creates some interesting friend or foe slash blue-on-blue -blue incidents if you're not careful. On the flip side, they're a lot of fun to play with.
and now we're ready to actually start placing some units. So right now I've got my time of day set. I believe it's right at dusk. Yep, right at dusk. I don't know why I set that to 9.01. That was just me being silly, apparently. Copy current date and time. Let's hold my mouse here. Perfect. So now we're 7 o'clock. This is a Zulu time, obviously, January 1st of 1985. Let's go ahead and get some units. So there's a lot of different ways to bring units into the game. I'm actually going to switch off the Sentinel layer real quick, and I'm going to flip on Stamen real fast, just to kind of get things a little... Oh, there we go. Much better. Now, there's a couple different ways that you can import and add units into the world. First of all, again, it depends on the kind of battle that you're doing. Are we doing a naval battle? Are we doing an air battle? Are we doing a combination naval air battle? You know, we have to kind of decide that. Obviously, we can do ground use, but that's going to get a little crazy as well. So the standard way to add something to the world is you press the insert key on your keyboard, and you simply click where you want that item to be inserted. Selecting up to be top, you can select if you want an aircraft, which also includes helicopters, surface ship, which also includes platforms, submarines, self-explanatory, and facilities, which is everything. So for example, if I flip over to facility and I type in, let's say I want a T-64, and you can go ahead and you can see all these T-64s. You can sort it by name. You can set to what country you want to check it out. You can shut off hypothetical platforms if you need to. And there's also this great feature called Custom GUID, which allows you to name items. So for example, if I want to take it extremely crazy, I could sit there and say, do something really nuts. We'll say this is a platoon 1-1 or something like that. When you're ready to place your unit, you just press the OK key, and there it is. It's just sitting there, way, way, way down there, just chilling in the middle of the map. Naturally, of course, Ecuador is not probably going to be packing a T-64BM, but I'll say, oh, oh, look at that. So once you place the unit in the map, you can't just click and drag to move it. If you want to move it, you have to click on the unit you want to move, press the M key, and then simply click on where you'd like that item to move. Now, here's where it gets a little fun you'll notice that it's got this beautiful little red circle around it. Those circles correspond to the maximum range of a particular unit. If I go to map units for a second, you can actually see what the different colors correspond to on the map. I also, by the way, always switch to selected unit. So we're on our route 10 apparently. So I've got my little tank. So if I wanted to move it again, just press M and click somewhere else. Now, a single group of tanks, keep in mind this is actually four tanks. This is not one tank. We can scoot up here real quick and click this and you can get all the information about, you know, generic. Again, a bullet. So I'm going to go ahead and now make a copy. Now, when you make a copy, there's really two different ways to do this. By the way, you can also right-click on somebody if you need to and go to Scenario Editor, and then you can go in here and edit some of those details, but I'm not going to change that yet. If I want to make a copy, I press the C key, and I simply click where I want the copy to be. If I press the C key again, I press the C key again. Now I have an entire company. This is actually a very, very large reinforced company of armored vehicles sitting here on the road. Now, there's a difference between copying and cloning. Now, if I make an airplane, for example, let's um, actually, that's not going to be a good example. Well, actually, yeah, we'll do that. We'll do that. Let me grab myself a C-130H. Let's say I have a C-130. We'll just borrow one from Alicia. We'll do some cargo. We'll go ahead and click on it, and we'll go ahead and uh, edit cargo, which is a little bit of work. Again, we're getting a little fancy, but that's fine. Oh, we'll add a couple howitzers. Why not? Okay. Now, if I take the C-130, it now has cargo on board. If I click this button, you can see I'm carrying those two howitzers. If I make a copy with the C key and place it, notice the copy is not carrying the cargo that the original version was carrying. If I want to copy the cargo over too, this is critical, press Shift-C. Then when I click, check it out it's going to hold on to the cargo. Anyway, I just wanted to share that with you because it's one of those things that I always forget about and it always makes me absolutely crazy. So anyway, we've got our little kind of platoon on the road here. If we want to adjust the direction that the platoon is facing, we can click on somebody, right click on it. This applies to everything, by the way. Scenario editor, and we can set orientation. Now, lucky for us, we're not using radians. These are degrees, but basically 180 is going to be facing straight down. 90 degrees is going to be straight right. 270 degrees is going to be straight left. And obviously 360 slash zero is going to be straight up. Personally, I like to kind of play one of these games where I'm like, oh, let's get the, let's get this unit, uh, that's, uh, that's about 33.7 degrees, and then you come in here and you do one of these things and try to get it as close as you can. Now, here's something that's going to make you insane. If I go ahead and do that, and now I clone the unit, <laughs> his orientation goes back to zero automatically. Oh, that's frustrating. I really wish they'd fix that. You'll notice if I click him, he's still facing 35 degrees, which is what I told him to do. Okay, 
So that's the basic gist for placing those kind of units. Now, for example, if I wanted to set like a little like desert fortress up over here, I could click here. You could go back to facility. You could say desert, you know, set up a little desert fort or something like that. And let's say that there's a triple A platform here. We want something, nothing too big, nothing too big. Uh, we're going to buy a 35 millimeter here. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not being scientifically accurate about this. We're just having some fun. And of course, wherever there's an anti-aircraft gun, there's always some dude with an SA-14. Grab that one, and well, we got a good little setup right here. This little kind of reinforced little town sitting in the middle of nowhere. By the way, one of the neat features we have now in this particular version is if you have TAC view, you can, of course, switch to 3D, which is really cool because when you go to place units now, it'll actually highlight them. Let me zoom in a little bit. It'll actually highlight them on the map so you can get kind of a feel for where everything is. Apparently, this guy decides to stand in the air, but it doesn't surprise me. Just taking a quick peek around here, you can see that the terrain, I have not gone too, too crazy with the terrain. I got a little bit of a hill. I take it back a little bit of a hill so it's a relatively flat you also have you know it's engagement circle and stuff like that and you can see our one little tank the bullet basically facing in that direction which is kind of neat but anyway we don't worry about that okay so the next thing i want to show you is how to group units now grouping units is pretty cool you simply select the units you want and press the g key now sometimes when you group a unit you go shoot i wanted to include these guys too well good news you can grab them all at once and press g when i do that you've grouped the entire group together now if i want to get rid of a group i simply click on it and press the delete key so now it's going to get rid of the entire group now if you have a group and you want to break a single member out of said group you can click on the group press the nine key on your numpad to switch to normal select mode find the one you want to get out of the group and press d so now if I press 9 again to switch back to normal mode, you'll notice he's chilling over here. Let's go ahead and get rid of that group, and let's cause a problem. I'm going to go ahead and grab these two. I'm going to grab these two. Now what happens when you try to combine a group with a group? You're going to get that. So um, <laughs> it literally even tells you how to fix the problem when that happens, which, again, come over here, delete him, grab the two groups and group. Now, sometimes when you make a group, you get the wrong guy who's leading the show. Let's say I want this one in the back for some reason. Now all you have to do to fix that is you can click on the formation editor and simply find the one that you want to fix. Let's go get our bouillet in the back. I'm probably pronouncing that horribly wrong, and you're all making fun of me. Boulot. Oh, it's a boulot. Yeah, so it's like a bullet. Got it. Sorry. I'm going to go ahead and click Set Group Lead, and we're now good to go. Now, one of the cool things you could do in this screen, too, if you're one of those people, is you can actually set what his position is. So, for example, if I wanted to go ahead and uh, set it so that he sits right here, and then I'm going to click on this one, I'm going to set his relative bearing. It simply means rotate when everybody else rotates. Go ahead and grab the one that used to be our previous leader. I'm going to go ahead and set this one way, way in the back like this. Now, if I tell these guys to start rolling, notice, by the way, when I select them, he does that. You tell him to just kind of roll in that direction. Yeah, go quickly, please. Go quickly. Go ahead and unpause time. You're going to notice they're all going to dot, dot, dot. And they've queued themselves up very, very nicely. Now, where it gets kind of fun is if I tell them to go in the other direction. Watch this. Whoop. <laughs> they actually stay in a proper formation now, which is really, really cool, and it's very, very, very realistic. My favorite use of groups, by the way, is when I do have a situation kind of like this, I can highlight everybody, group them, and then give them a nice logical name like... Uh, Route 10 Outpost. Press OK. OK. So that should be about all you need to know as far. By the way, if you need to get rid of a unit, you simply click on it, press Delete. Click on it, press Delete. It's gone. So that's the basic gist of everything. Now we're going to get a little more complicated. So let's say we want to do something where we're using some kind of airport. Now airports, it's going to get complicated. Let me clean all this stuff up real quick. We don't need that. Let's go ahead and add an airport here. We'll do the Tumaco. Oh, getting a little bit of artifacts, but nothing too, too bad. I'm going to press insert. I'm going to go ahead and click the mouse. And that's going to bring up the facility. If you are going to be using an airport that cannot be attacked, you can use these really, really cool units called single unit airfields. This also comes in a port format. If you're going to be designing an airport that has like individual pieces in it, you're going to have to build it by piece. So for example, if I said runway, you're going to have to place each one of those. We'll do that in a minute. But for now, Let's go ahead and get ourselves an airport. So when you do this, you basically can dictate how large the airport. By the way, single unit airfields cannot be attacked. Keep that in mind. You're going to have to build them by hand if you want to do that. So let's go ahead and get ourselves a pretty normal airport. We have two runways facing 260, about this length. Pretty good. Press OK. Let's go ahead and give that a name. We just press the R key, by the way. Tumaco. We'll call it AB. 
And now remember, we want to set orientation. So without knowing much about this environment, I guarantee the wind is probably coming in like this, or it's coming in like this. I'm going to assume it's this way. So I'm going to set the orientation to face roughly, let's say, about 45 degrees. Now, something you want to keep in mind when you're using airports is that orientation is now the direction the airplanes are going to fly towards in order to land at that particular place. So kind of keep that in mind. You can always run into a situation where there's like a big mountain here and you're landing through the mountain. But just, like I said, keep that in the back of your head is all I'm saying. So now we have Tumaco Airports. I'm probably mispronouncing that horribly. My apologies to the people of Colombia. Okay, so when you set an airport that is a single unit one, it's super easy to add airplanes. You can just come over here and hit Edit Hosted Aircraft. Now, we'll be a little bit more careful here. We'll actually set the maps that the guys want to Columbia this time. Now, let's say we were making a scenario in 85. I can click the From button, and it'll actually highlight what types of aircraft would be available at that particular time. So it looks to me like we've got a couple Mirage 5s, the Colombian version of the Mirage 5. It even looks like they have 27 of them. So let's add a couple of those. We can go ahead and dictate a call sign. Keep in mind if you have more than one airplane, we can use the call sign basically to add more stuff to it. So I could say, um, I don't know, Mirage SQD, Mirage Squad. <laughs> that sounds pretty good. It says there's 27. Uh, squadron sizes in the real world vary considerably depending on where you are. The American Full Air Force Squadron, for example, is 24. Typical Russian squadrons are usually between 12 and 18. 15 is kind of the magic number. And keep in mind, bomber squadrons, support squadrons are going to be naturally smaller. This says that we have 27 of them. That kind of sounds like a, probably a pair of squadrons plus reinforcement ones. But we'll just grab all 27. Why not? Add selected. So now we've added these 27 aircraft to this air base. Now if I press F6, you can see that in the air facilities, it's actually spread them out between the different hangars and the different parking spaces and stuff like that. Again, this is why I love single unit airports, if they're not being attacked. Let's go to aircraft status. I'm not going to go nuts here, but because we have the map editor, we can grab a group of them, we can hit ready arm, and we can decide exactly what we want. Let's see here what seems to oh, this is a it's decent, decent, decent. What do we got for range on these? I'm actually curious. I've never used these. Yikes. Yeah, we're going to have to do something that's got a little bit more reach. Um, let's see here. We'll grab this one. Go ahead and ready those immediately. We'll just, again, this is just for an example because we have these two buttons. By the way, if you did not have unlimited ammo on, you would not have this option if you did not add ammo to a base. Keep that in mind. We'll take a look at how to do that in a second. Let's see. What kind of range? We have 290 on these two. 510. Oh, we'll take it. Grab those guys. We'll come down here and grab this group. We'll just go ahead and do the same thing. And we'll now we'll just say these guys are maintenance. And we'll grab the rest of the guys and we'll set them up for reserve in case they need them a little later on. Again, that's all standard command stuff. I'm not going to go too too crazy here. You can come down here and you can even set time to ready because again we're on map edited mode. So that's all set. That's all set. That's all set. We can launch those aircraft and go nuts. Now a minute ago I mentioned that you sometimes if we are not using under this particular scenario feature, if we don't have unlimited ammo on, we have to give a base ammo so that you can load airplanes with weapons. To do that, we simply click on the magazines button. We're simply going to click on add magazine, and you can go pretty crazy pretty fast with this particular stuff. So I believe I saw Mark 82s. Let's go ahead and say Mark 82. Um, actually, these are by magazine, so we're going to have to go ahead and find a magazine that we can use. I see some carrier magazines. Uh, let's see, there's some helicopter mag magazines. I really wish there was just magazine number one. <laughs> that would be wonderfully helpful. Let's go ahead and type that in. Let's see here. Let's see. Um, let's just pick one. Oh, we'll take United Kingdom Carrier Magazine. Why not? So when you click on that, nothing happens, right? Well, it's it's actually there. Now, if I click here and open this up, it's given us a magazine with all these cool little weapons. Now, if you remember, we can delete. We can click a group of these. And we can go like this. We can click Remove Weapons and go nuts. So now the neat thing is if I click on Carrier Magazine and click on Add Weapons, now we can add the Mark 82 and everything like that. I think it's MK. 82? He's making a liar at me. What happens if I type in 82? We have plenty of GBUs. Oh, they do MK82. Make sure the weapon you're adding equals the weapon that you're actually going to be having. So now we can scroll down here. We can go get ourselves an LDGB. And that looks pretty good. So I'm going to add that. So now if I scroll down, you can see I have 51 Mark 82s here. So now if I were to come over here, if I were to come over here, grab these guys out of maintenance, m arm them with Mark 82s. Let's go ahead and press a room, 
ready immediately, what will have happened is I will have reduced the amount of weapons I now have in that magazine. Uh, where's my market? Okay, so it's making a lie out of me because I click ready immediately. But you get the idea. Okay, so um, now let's go ahead and take a look at aircraft. Obviously, you can set up missions and stuff like that. Let's go ahead and look at um, ships now. Ships are pretty simple as well. You simply come up to the map, press the insert key again, and then click where you'd like your ship to be. Ships are super duper simple. You simply select the option that you want to do. You can decide between this class, anything along those lines. Again, we're having some fun with Columbia today, so we'll go ahead and take a look. Wow, that's pretty cool. Then what do we say? 1985, so obviously a 1984 vessel. We can go ahead and click on it. We can rename it. We can do anything we need to do. We'll go ahead and add, uh, ooh, that's not actually possible because it'd be 96. Ooh, what do we do? What do we do? We'll add another one. Um, I'm going to call this one. Whoops, not French. There we go, the Revenge of Tango and, of course, the Amarante. So as usual, we can go ahead and group these, select both of them, press the G key. We can always go to Formation option, we can rename them, we can come in here and we say, say G. Keep in mind, these are facing north. If we want to rotate them, you have to use the same technique to rotate them. You can also set their initial speed and everything over here on the right. You can give them an initial place like that, and now you are good to go. So a quick little word of warning, when you are adding helicopters to surface action groups, you want to make sure that you add it by ship, not by group. Because if you do it by group, you're going to end up putting the helicopters in funky places. Same thing with aircraft, by the way, you're going to end up with like a Harrier in the back of a frigate, which I'm sure is possible, but it's not very likely. So the last thing I want to show you today is basically how to kind of set up that initial enemy AI. Now let me go ahead and zoom out a little bit here to make things a little bit simpler. Well, geez, that is right on the border. Let's switch over to Ecuador real quick. Let's go ahead and add ourselves a single unit airport. By the way, uh, one of the greatest tools in this program is if you click on Editor and click on Import Export Units, you can actually open up entire groups of different types of units by default. Coming down to Ecuador, you can actually see there's several pre-built airports. Might as well grab them, right? Load selected installations, close, and check it out. It preloaded these beautiful airports for me. So now if I zoom way, 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 way in, you'll actually see these particular airports are the fancy airports because they actually have each individual piece built. By the way, if you're going to build a fancy airport, make sure you do it in such a way that you can actually, oh, we don't need that ship. You, I need you. All right, you're going to be annoying. That's okay. Yeah. You can see very clearly all the individual hangars. Don't worry about the hangars facing the wrong direction. That doesn't actually affect anything. Okay, so like I was saying, because of those imports, I don't have to go through the trouble of building this all by hand. You're not going to get imports for everywhere on Earth, which is kind of a bummer. But like I said, we want to quickly set up some AI here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a pretty good old-fashioned barrier cap. Go ahead and give myself a couple different points here. When you're doing reference points, I always like to click on them and rename them uh, West Point. And make sure you deselect the other one before you try to do this one, East Point. Uh, let's go ahead and add some aircraft. Let's see what we got for Ecuador. Uh, do we have anything from the 80s I can use? Actually, we have the Kefir, which is... Was, oh, an F1A. Beautiful. Oh, it's 1990, though. Uh, Jaguar is not too, too bad. Now you wet. Eh, that works. Eh, we'll go with the Mirage. Oh, well. Uh, we'll add 15. Go ahead and arm these guys all up. This would never happen in the real world. There's just no such thing as having an entire group. Keep in mind, again, if you wanted to limit the availability of munitions, you'd have to set that setting and add the everything manually. So we'll go ahead and grab those two points. We're going to press Control F11. We're going to do bar cap. We're going to do patrol, AAW. It's going to freak out. Oh, it didn't freak out too bad today. That's okay. I'm going to come down to movement style. I'm going to set it to repeatable loop. We're going to do this in groups of four aircraft. One third, we don't want them to go exploring. We'll add all these guys right here. And now we are all set. So if I were to go ahead and run this, oh, by the way, let's go double check to see what these guys are doing. Uh, it's going to be a hit and run. So we want them to do a single attack and then run um, right there. That's the way I want it to be set up. Go ahead and run the map real quick. Now they should all be taken off. There they go. 
Notice they immediately ran out of fuel and uh, came back in for landing. <laughs> we need something with a little bit more reach. These countries are very, very large. Okay, so that should be about it for the basic mission editor stuff. If you were looking to go into scenario editor and stuff like that, event editors, we'll do that at another video. Again, this should be more than enough to be able to throw down a couple airplanes. You know, if I were being kind of mean, I could switch to Columbia. And for some reason, they've got a brand new set of F-35Bs. Set this F 35Bs. We'll get the nice one. Oh, the 2025. Load it up. Press OK. We're going to go like this. And we're going to do one of these things. I'm going to go like this. And, and the F 35 is basically going to roast these guys. Well, once he gets out of range, I guess. On a sign. Attack. Don't disappoint me. Okay. <laughs> So that should be enough to get you kind of started as far as map editing goes in this program. There are other little details that you're probably going to get kind of tricked by over time. One detail, for example, is notice that this beautiful blue ring is starting to shrink. Once this blue ring hits where his base is, it's going to do it. If you need to change what base you're working at, you can just right click and you can hit select new base. There's only one base in Columbia right now, so that's the only one he could pick from. Of course, if you were a carrier version of this aircraft and I had an available carrier, I could set the carrier as the base as well. All right, if you have any questions, uh, just kind of let me know down there in the little video. Later on, we'll get a little bit fancier, but for now, that should get you started.